700 pages. 700 fucking pages! Yikes. What? Good grief. Oof. Okay. What? Huh? No sense. No. Okay. <laughs> oh boy. Hi, my name is Rachel and today I'm going to talk to you about which one is this? Oh, none of the titles make sense. Passage of Time by J.M. Buckler. That is the one and only time I will say her name correctly. And don't let her fool you. She does absolutely hate it. This is a thing I do here where I review books that have been one star and mass. What? What? One starred and mass by uh, people who were uh, unhappy with a particular thing that an author did. So uh, I've done this a few times. This is the third book in her trilogy. There are apparently going to be three more companion books after this in a different trilogy. And my answer to will I be reading that is absolutely no. No. I have suffered enough. I make a decent amount of ad revenue from these videos and I have suffered enough. I have done my time. No more. Okay, Passage of Time is Ugly Ass Cover. It's the third book in her Seeker of Time trilogy, I think is what it's called. I will very briefly sum up what minuscule plot exists in this trilogy, but if you want full context, I highly recommend you go watch the other two videos where I talk about what happens, uh, which honestly there's very little, but it will help because I'm not going to explain everything. The basic premise of this is that there's a girl, Alara, and she moved to Texas, magically found out that she had a twin brother from this guy named Jax, this dude with this eight pack. And um, he's like, hey, you two are from a different planet and there's an evil dictator and I want you to come help me stop this dictator. That was book one, just information, no plot, not a single drop of a plot. Book two, they go to the planet that they are originally from, Arunix, and they have many conversations and uh, learn to fight with knives because they did not bring any guns to this planet, which would have been helpful and in fact would have made everything moot. They could have just brought a gun and shot Zenith the dictator, but alas, no. Uh, and then book three, we're here to talk about it. So um, the end of the, the book two, <laughs> which I, I even hesitate to call these books. Uh, the end of part two of this thing that she wrote into existence is um, that Jax, Alara's crush, who they kissed one time and then she was like, I love you. And then he got kidnapped by the bad people and tortured. Then they go get him and then they have to like medically fix him. And then afterwards he's like, I hate you. So, you know, Peter Mellar. He runs, he, he abandons Alara and Alara's like, that's fine because there's this other guy here named Orion and he could do. <laughs> that was it. And then that, that was the end of the book. It was like, maybe Orion can be what I need. I'm just going to go ahead and tell you that obviously he wasn't. I wish that she would have gone that route and just summed it up in the 0.7 second of that that I just did because then we could have avoided the first 30% of this 700 page book. 700 pages. 680 something technically, but I'm rounding up because I wanted to die. 700 pages? Like, I know that she loves Jay Kristoff, but you don't have to try to emulate him by, or Sarah J. Mass, who I believe she also loves, by just typing, typing, typing words. Just a bunch of words, and then you put them into a, it's like, you have to edit? Please edit? For the love of God? Does no one care about my sanity? Let's just, let's just jump, let's just jump into this disastrous, I wonder how long this video is going to be. I truly wonder, because... 700 pages. 700 fucking pages! God, I can't wait to delete this shit off my phone. I um, am not saying that I did not pay for this. I'm also not not saying that I did not pay for this and found a EPUB of it. I'm not saying either of those things. Notes, of which there are many. A lot of them are just saying, yikes, what? Good grief. Oof, okay, what? Huh? No sense. No. Okay. Basically my thoughts. You can go now. That's it. <laughs> so she starts her book, as always, um, by saying things that she thinks sounds like purple prose, but in reality just sound ridiculous every single time. Every book starts that way. My body sank deeper with each pain breath, the soft mattress mocking me with the comfort I refused to feel 
Like an extra pair of fingers, my eyes traced the cracks in the black wooden ceiling. Jagged and unforgiving, the deep grooves grew wider at each intersection, then shrunk in size, fading in the labyrinth. None of this is necessary. None of this is pretty. It's, it's, it's just words. It's just word vomit so that she can feel like she has purple prose, which she does not. She could try and eventually probably get the hang of it, but she doesn't try and whoever her beta readers are did her a, oh my God. Those, go, those people are going straight to hell because they did her such a disservice. This is awful. <laughs> And then, like, page two, she's like, My pulse thumped in my ears while my eyes burned a hole in the wooden door. Each morning I woke up in a cold sweat and thought, how did I end up here? And the real question is, how did I end up here? All right, so over six weeks had passed since Jax, our guide, our friend, my first love, abandoned us on that fateful afternoon. Just want to point out, once again, once again, that her and Jax, who she just referred to as my first love, they kissed one time, professed their feelings, and then Jax got kidnapped. They've known each other for a few months. This is so weird to me. They fought the they don't they don't have conversations. She does not know his last name. I, I don't know. Anyway. Uh, once again she picks up the habit of saying piercing blue eyes every single time she talks about Jax, which was a huge thing that she did was repeating things in the first book. And she just, she like stopped doing it in the second book and then she just went all in <laughs> the third book and was like, how many fucking times can I fit in the phrase piercing blue eyes into 700 pages? I think I counted 10. I lost count. Uh, I also gave up on life. It was, it was a time. It was a time. So here we are at this doctor's house that she's living in, who coincidentally is the doctor that uh, helped birth her and her twin brother Cyrus, and they're living there and she starts to get the hots for the doctor's son, Orion, and she's like talking about dress for the day, dark gray shorts covered his muscular thighs and a khaki colored shirt covered his, hugged his biceps. Every dude in this is described the same. Every single dude is like muscular and I can't even differentiate between them because it's all just like muscles over here, muscles over there. It's like, we get it. You love muscles. You love them. Cool. I don't care. I don't care. I just want it. I just want a plot. I just want a drop of a plot. Can I please get that? And as usual, Alara's personality has not changed or developed in any way, shape or form. She still collapses to her knees every time something is like emotionally devastating. Um, instead of just being a normal person, uh, she like physically actually collapses to her knees all the time. It's weird as fuck. Like imagine having a conversation with somebody and like, <laughs> she's like, oh, oh no, Orion, oh, I have f feelings. It's just like, uh, is this, is this necessary? I don't, mm -mm. Then Samson, their mentor person, sort of, who like taught them how to knife fight and also taught Jax and stuff, shows up and he's a good guy, but he's also a terrible person. Um, and I think that she like meant for that to be a point, but it just, the problem with this guy is that he repeatedly uses, first of all, <laughs> before I even say this, I have to say again, that the fact that they use 21st century American U.S. English is weird as hell. That does not make any sense. That does not make any sense. No. Uh, Arunix is a planet with 2,000 people. You would think that if somehow the language that came from Earth, you would explain that? She never did. I don't, I don't get it. This doesn't make any fucking sense. It doesn't make any fucking sense. Samson loves to use the phrase, you're a pussy. And it's like, first of all, did we need to make a runix as sexist as Earth is? We did not. We did not. But not only did she, she went out of her way to do this. Like, took weird steps to go out of her way to make this place sexist. So like, Zenith, the dictator, he didn't need to be a sexist dictator. Like you could have made him scary in other ways, but instead it's like, he hates women. Okay, cool. <laughs> and he taught Jax that women were only for having sex and stuff. I don't know. It's just, it doesn't, like, why though? Why? Because sexism and misogyny on earth is rooted in 
historical things that happen. Like the sexism that we know today has roots in history. So like, what's the story with that? Why, or why didn't we just not have that? Like we could have had scarier things, but instead it's like, how can we shit on women uh, repeatedly? For no reason, it's great. In fact, there's only one type of animal on a runix. Uh, they're called grazers. Grazers can only be farmed by men. I'm not kidding because grazers do not like women. Absolutely no reason for any of this. This is just bad writing that just gives me way too much information on how Jennifer thinks of women. It's just, I didn't want to know. Could have created any kind of world and you went with one that is like super awful to women. <laughs> Why? Why did you do that? For no purpose. Like there was no pro plot relevant reason. She just did it. She's just like, oh, why the fuck not? I mean, I can think of a few reasons why the fuck not. Like, why? So Samson shows up and uh, like physically abuses Cyrus, like pushes a table at him, makes him bleed, and says, when did you become such a pussy? All we get is that Cyrus doesn't agree with like the plan that Samson has, which the plan doesn't even make sense. It's like, Zenith is special. So Alara and Cyrus also being special because they were born during an eclipse he fears them for that reason and then he like if you make the village people think you're more special than zenith then they will not want to follow him like this no care was taken in the writing of this villain how he came to power why he's in power still why there hasn't been an uprising that worked against him why the people the two thousand people who live on this planet this entire planet, 2,000 people, what the fuck, will follow him. Like there's no, he keeps murdering these people, but then she does not explain like what good he's done. And and she was like, there was a five year period where he was great. Okay, how? Like what specifically did he do? What did he do that made these people so loyal? Is he leading by fear? How? Why isn't there an uprising that worked before? I just, I, I don't know, there was no care taken here. And I've read enough fucking sci-fi and fantasy to know when care is taken in developing a villain versus just like, I have something to say about Hitler and I'm going to do it in my sci-fi book. Like, mm, no, you need beta readers so bad. But J.G. Wentworth 877 Cash Now does not take feedback. I mean, even now, like I see her like recently she said that uh, I sent her threats that never happened. Like I just reviewed her book and she just doesn't take feedback. So, you know, what can you do? So now that he's saying the people will side with the team who has the better odds. Your job is to show them your unique abilities. But then later in the book, they do and they still are hesitant to follow them. Like it, it never really, it's always like, Okay, now the people will follow you for this reason. Now they'll follow you for this reason. Now that reason doesn't make sense anymore. Like, it's just like, this was so convoluted. It doesn't make any sense. He said, um, he says that sharing the Solon and Lunin traits like Xenon does, Xenon, Xenon, <laughs> dictator of the 21st century. Uh, Zenith has Solon and Lunin, which is like, you know, these people have either sun traits or moon traits and it's everything about this is stupid. And Zenith has both but so do Alara and Cyrus. So he's basically like, compete, but then that doesn't work. So like, oh my God, everything will change. The two of you are the perfect trifecta. Oh, that's right, she said this in the last book. You're younger than Zenith, more mysterious, and have the knowledge of Earth under your belts. You are the winning combination of what it takes to shatter his reign. Why is younger better? Why is someone being mysterious better? What do the people of Arunix care about Earth? They don't know anything about Earth. They don't know anything about anything. This planet is described as being in the Dark Ages. They don't know shit about shit. That doesn't make any sense. That, you're young. You're mysterious. You have knowledge of Earth. And she didn't even list the powers. What the fuck? It doesn't make any sense. This doesn't make any sense. She also describes things so badly throughout this entire series. And I keep hoping every book will get better, which is why I won't read the next trilogy. She said, the elated expression on Cyrus's face rivaled an Orbit gum commercial. I put that on Twitter and my friend from Suriname was like, what the fuck? And I was like, yeah, exactly. Because if you are not a US person, you don't know what the fuck that's about. An Orbit gum commercial? You couldn't have described a smile better? 
than using this? You son of a biscuit-eating bulldog. What the French toast? Did you think I wouldn't find out about your little doo-doo head cootie queen? Who are you calling a cootie queen, you lint liquor? Pickle you, cumquat! You're overreacting. No, Bill, overreacting was when I put your convertible into a wood chipper. Stinky McStink face! You Hoboken. Fabulous. New Orbit Raspberry Mint cleans another dirty mouth. And in general, the planet of Arunix makes no sense. There's no mirrors for no reason. There's no bugs. There's no birds. Um, I'm pretty sure it's a well-known scientific fact that on Earth, if bugs were to die off eventually, so would the humans. But I guess JD Bootlicker just didn't go to science class. I don't know. I can't speak for her on that end. All I know is that um, that doesn't make any fucking sense. There's only one animal that... <laughs> <laughs> there's no bugs, there's no birds, there's weird trees, there's water that heals you but not enough, there's clear stones that disappear if you rub them together. Uh, this planet makes no fucking sense. Everything she made, she just, she just did enough to like have, like, basically, you know when you're watching a play and the background, you're not really paying attention to it, it's just there to sort of set the scene. You don't really get, like, fixated on it because if you do you're going to start to notice that the background is fake and then the whole scene falls apart for you right you don't want to pay attention to that you want to pay attention to the plot i don't feel like i need to explain myself further i feel like that basically just sums up her entire her entire planet that she created she's fighting with feelings for uh orion she's constantly thinking about Jax, and uh her and orion go on like a dinner date and cyrus her brother hates it he's super weirdly paternal towards her over this. I just, there was no reason for this. There was no reason to make a love triangle. There was no reason for Alara and Orion not to just have been friends this whole time. Same with her and Cyrus in book one, before they found out they were siblings, they were into each other. There was no reason. She could have just had platonic dude friends, but no, we can't have that. Not allowed. JM Bottle Brush will not allow it. Cyrus like bangs on her door after her date with Orion because it ends weird and she's like a deep growl rattled in his throat as he slammed his palm against my door. I brace myself afraid he's bust into the room. Why are you afraid of your own brother? That's abuse. And then she rotated her neck and whispered into her pillow, why am I acting crazy? One minute I'm cool, I'm, the next I'm hyperventilating. Maybe I have PTSD. I think that if you have not in depth studied PTSD a la Susanna Collins did for the Hunger Games, you should not, you should not talk about it. Just don't write about it. Don't try to give your characters PTSD. If you, and I know that she, it's clear that in her acknowledgments, she talked to like dudes she knew who were in the military. Okay, I don't care. I don't care. Carlos was in the military. I would not talk to him about my book that I'm writing. <laughs> like, I, you, you have to do more research beyond having a, a quick texty text with a dude you know who was in the Marine Corps in order to understand PTSD. That's just, anyway, that's a lot of assumptions on my part, but that's where it seems to have come from is that, oh, I know a little bit about a PTSD. I can talk about it. Mm -hmm, please don't. Um, then she gets compared to Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, which, uh, cool, we're gonna shit on mental health some more. And then, <laughs> all of a sudden, out of nowhere, Alara starts to have these weird internal, I don't even know what to call them. Are they dreams? No, because she's awake. Full out conversation visions happening with somebody who she calls a mask dealer. Somebody who wears a mask and is like uh, trying to get her to like gamble with things. Um, it's, it's weird as fuck. And I was hoping that when it was introduced, it was just like some weird one-off thing that it wasn't. It happened for the rest of the fucking book. It was awful. It starts out, tired of playing games and ready to cash in his chips. He wanted to leave life's casino. <laughs> Stop. Uh, my twisted mind found pleasure in his suffering, so I brought my winnings to a new table where the masked figure, the dealer of life, stood waiting, eager for me to toss the dice. I rested my head on Orion's shoulder and he leaned against me. Why am I leading him on? This won't end well. Go for it, Alara. Take a chance. My free hand slid along the patches of his pants. Orion shuddered above. And then the masked, <laughs> the masked dealer said, good roll. Seven wins the bet. Why? <laughs> I. She's like, no, I can't. I'm tired of playing games. 
Like a disturbing scene from a horror movie, the dealer tilted its head. The sudden movement tugged at the mask covering its face. Come on, Alara. The silk fluttered around its hidden lips. Just one more roll. Why are we doing this gambling thing? I don't get it. Like, what is the, what is the purpose? She's never been into gambling before. What is this? <laughs> Why a dealer? Like, what, what is this metaphor? And like, she's also seeing Jax and she's like, please help me. And he's not really there. She's seeing in her own head, a masked casino dealer and Jax. And he's like, you have to fight this demon on your own. And then he disappears into a cloud of smoke. It's just fucking weird. It's fucking weird. And unfortunately, this happened throughout the whole book. And then she also sees her dead mom. And then also death itself shows up, like actually shows up in the final battle. There was so much unexplained and unnecessary weirdness in this book. I don't understand. Like there is, there is a reason why this would never get traditionally published. And this is part of it. I cannot believe, who, who beta read these? Who? Who beta read these? I just want to talk. I just want to talk about what your standards are. What are your standards? How, what are you doing? Anyway, so the mass dealer, the mass dealer, <laughs> the dealer wrapped its icy hands around my wrist. I won't play your little game, she said. That's what they all say. Who's they? Who the fuck? This is not a person, by the way. In the end, it gets revealed it was Alara's dark side the whole time. So who else is Alara's dark side playing with? What? That doesn't make any fucking sense. She said, you're addicted to the game, Alara. What? <laughs> I'm a dick. I'm addicted to you. Um, oh, I forgot about this. this <laughs> so um, there's a part where her and uh, Orion and Cyrus are um, being taught by Samson again to, you know, fight, do the stabby stab. And <laughs> Samson says, well, I'll be damned. With two M's. <laughs> <laughs> it reminds me, it's like a beaver. <laughs> well, I'll be damned. What happens? Orion and Alara actually kiss after almost, I don't know, fooling around or something. Uh, after that, they almost kiss. Um, and then she's like, ew, that was a bad kiss. And literally 30 seconds after they kiss, Jack shows back up after abandoning them. And she's like, oh my God, Jax, yay. This fucking book, man. <laughs> Jack shows up and his personality is totally different. He is a changed man. He shows up, he kisses Alara. He's like, I abandoned you and I was bad. And then I tried to kill myself, but then a force, probably God, uh, kept me from killing myself. And my whole life flashed before my eyes. And now I see that I was living in resentment because you know, JD Wentworth loves to talk about negative emotions. And now I'm a changed person and I want to be here for you. And it's like, this, where are we? We are 20% um, into this book and this is all that's happened. Talking and Jack showing back up. And some weird casino dealer that Alara is hallucinating. This is the stupidest shit I have ever, ever read. This actually made me rethink my rating of A Gentle Tyranny. That's how bad this is. But A Gentle Tyranny is <sighs> technically traditionally published, although it's a Christian publisher. Sharing that intimate moment confirmed that I wanted you in my life, but allowing you in meant opening the gates that guarded my heart. I just had to dust off the bullshit and grab the key buried underneath. I, she wants so badly to write with metaphors, but she can't do it. And I'm like, bitch, please stop trying. It's so cringy and so bad. Like if you would, first of all, it would cut down tremendously on the word count in this if the metaphors would stop. But also it would cut down on the uh, emotional anguish that I had to go through trying to parse through the bullshit that she was writing. You have to understand <laughs> that when you say things, they have to have like roots in cultural norms. Like you have to understand what a person is saying and it's not overt these meanings, but like that's, oh my God, what is that? Dust off the bullshit and grab the key buried underneath. What are you talking about? He was like, I wanted to, you know, I couldn't take off the mask, the jaded bullshit, blah, blah, blah. Ew, and then he's like, your reaction confirms my theory. Let me, let me, I, if you let me finish my story, I think you'll discover the truth behind this story. Here's a hint, it's a story of redemption. You don't get to redeem yourself. 
You abandoned your girlfriend that you kissed one time. What the fuck? In the middle of a war. What the fuck? <laughs> you wanted to redeem yourself, you fucking weirdo. My note, my next note says, suddenly she doesn't have feelings for Orion. This is so stupid. Why am I reading this? Fair enough, past Rachel. Um, the kiss we shared on the cliffside, the moment before Pollux and the others showed up really opened my eyes. I had spent months going back and forth, wondering if I should express my feelings. And when I did, I realized our relationship with the, was a lost cause because I couldn't let go of my past. Imagine, imagine kissing somebody and then they feel, they think that like, nah, our relationship is a lost cause. What relationship? You kissed one time. <laughs> That's some kiss. She's like, I thought of the anguish that consumed me during Jack's absence and the relief I experienced since his return. My brother's lesson swirled in my mind. Yeah, Cyrus got apparently deep according to J.M. Birmingham's standards. He was right. My level of happiness didn't depend on Jack's or anything outside of myself. Bitch, you have been depressed for 19% of this book. It starts out with you staring at the ceiling, looking at the cracks because you're so fucking depressed. And then fucking Jack shows up and you're like, I'm fine now, but it's not because of Jack's. I'm fine because of me. Bitch, no, ew, oh my God, what in the Bella Swan? She also repeats these phrases that I think she thinks are really profound, but they are just utterly stupid. Like people make the best decisions they can regardless of the situation. I don't think she knows what regardless means. People make the best decisions they can within a situation, like, due to, not regardless of, due to a situation. If I am in a car accident, that's a situation I'm in. I'm going to respond <laughs> because of how the car accident went. Like, not regardless of it. I'm gonna do my best, sure, but I'm going to respond because of that, not regardless of it. What the fuck? That doesn't even make any fucking sense. More piercing blue eyes, blah, blah, blah. More earth references. Of course, uh, Jax's eight pack gets fucking, <laughs> brought up repeatedly. My eyes darted back and forth between the sharp lines of his jaw. If I have to read about one more person's jawline ever, in any book ever again, I'm burning every book I see. I'm gonna be a book burner. I'm gonna do a fascism. That joke went too far, it went too far. His eight pack, his impressive eight pack that rivaled top fitness models. I don't think she quite understands how fitness models get to look like that. Um, they have to like restrict water and anyway, moving on. Why can't I stop staring? Is it because of his absence? Is there a bug in here? Are you fucking kidding me? Absence makes the top of it. <laughs> absence makes the heart grow fonder. I swallowed. Fonder of something, that's for sure. I shut my eyes hoping to clear the lust that bur blurred my vision. That's another one she used a lot throughout this, ser this particular installment of her series was lust blurred my vision, lust glazed over his eyes. I don't know about you. I can't speak for everybody. That has never happened to me. If that's an actual thing, can y'all like let me know down below? Cause that's fucking, I've never fucking heard of that before. The mass dealer snickered, go for it, Alara. He won't mind. Oh, I get it. So the mass dealer essentially <laughs> is the inner goddess from E.L. James' Fifty Shades of Grey. I got it. I got what you're going for here. I mean, I hate it, but I got it. Then they're talking about Archer, who was the kid who had worked for Zenith, the bad guy, but was like, I'm going to help you, uh, and helped Jax escape, and then got, you know, like, murdered. So <laughs> Jax is like, Archer sacrificed himself for the future, for the greater good. I'd be dead had he not rescued me from the basement. The ex-collector found my eyes. She repeatedly refers to Jax as an ex-collector for no reason. Like, I mean, he is, but why do we have to keep being told that as the reader? I don't care. It's not relevant at all. You didn't take the head start he, give, he gave you, but your brother did. So what I'm hearing here is that Archer, to you, was expendable. <laughs> like, Jax really thinks he's the greater good. Okay. That seems out of character for him, but whatever. Out of character? I hardly know her. Um, <laughs> There's a lot of, like, hat drops to beliefs that J.M. Beetlejuice clearly has, like, there's, like, references to the American military. As somebody who was a military dependent, Carlos, uh, at, at, one at one time, served several years in the U.S. Air Force, um, I can tell you that the U.S. military is imperialistic bullshit. <laughs> so, like, this is lost on me when she's like, oh, wow, he imitated a Green Beret. I'm like, I, you don't, you don't know as much as you think you know about the military can guarantee. 
have lived on several bases can guarantee. <laughs> but people don't like to talk about that. Um, but also just in general, like being like, Zenith is clearly supposed to be Hitler, except she greatly misunderstands Hitler. I'm not saying Hitler was a good person. I'm saying that she does not understand how Hitler came to power. She does not understand how Hitler stayed in power. She does not understand what Hitler's motivations were. She doesn't understand anything. All she knows is the same old bullshit that we're taught in American schools, which is rudimentary at best. And also, <laughs> um, <laughs> Cyrus is having a conversation and she's like, he's having an animated conversation with Orion about the benefits of democracy. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> isn't it typical? that U.S. people think that they have like, we have like the greatest democracy in the world and we're like the most free. It's just, it's fucking comical. It's honestly fucking comical. It's just like, how can we like pound the pro-America bullshit into this book some more? It's fucking hilarious. Um, I do very much remember her saying that she does not have beliefs that align with Karl Marx. And uh, as somebody who actually uh, is familiar with the Communist Manifesto, which if you don't know, Marx wrote. Um, you all don't know what the fuck you're talking about. I'm not even that well versed on Marx, but I know better than to just believe Red Scare propaganda that's been perpetuated for the last 60 years. Like, chill, you have no idea what Karl Marx stood for. <laughs> and we don't have to pretend that America is like, yay, greatest country on earth. Anyway, I'm not going to start being a full on leftist in this video. I can do that in a different video. By the way, not a liberal full-on leftist. Fuck capitalism. Um, then they are going to, um, they're trying to figure out a plan and then they find out that Idalia, who is like a friend of theirs, sort of, who used to fuck Jax and now has a thing for Cyrus, Alara's twin brother, um, has been taken to Zenith's and it's obviously a fucking trap. Uh, but yeah, they're gonna sexually assault her at Zenith's because that's what they do. They are all sexual predators because that's, that's all of it. <sighs> Why authors who don't understand any nuance at all right about is like everybody's a sexual assaulter it's just tired and i'm tired of it so they're like we need we can't go barging in guns blazing oh knives i meant to say knives yeah you can't go in guns blazing because you didn't bring any which you should have and i still don't understand why this book would have been 30 pages long if you just brought a gun the, the whole series would be 30 pages long maybe even 25. so, so yeah samson shows up and he's like idalia they took idalia so they're on their way to Zenith to rescue Idalia, and she says, I can't wait until we get to Zenith, sarcastically saying, his dwelling is a combination of Disney World and Hell. Uh, Disney World is located in Florida, so I would argue that Zenith uh, obviously resides in Florida. <laughs> but <laughs> because Florida is hell. I would know I live under Governor Ron DeSantis. And she's like, who is that coming around the corner, kids? Is it Mickey? Donald? No, it's Pollux with a knife. I know she's really trying to be funny here and I, I honestly kind of wonder if if I would have thought that that was funny if I had not already experienced JM's other two books and JM herself also in my comment section so I wonder if I'm just like so <laughs> clouded over that I can't recognize the humor in that um, but the rest of the books are not funny so probably not. Welcome to the shittiest place on earth, or Arunix for argument's sake. I can agree with that. Um, Arunix is the shittiest place in the universe because it doesn't make any fucking sense. Um, Samson gets annoyed with Orion, calls him a pussy. He calls he calls everybody a pussy. The word pussy gets thrown around this book like six different times, always by men, of course, because we can't just have a world genitalia associated with women, slang terms for such cannot um, be used as a derogatory term for a man who's not meeting manly enough masculine standards. Can't have that. Can't just have a world without that, I guess, even though that would be great. That would be great, wouldn't it? Wouldn't that be fucking great? If you're looking for a term to switch out and stop using pussy, if you, a lot of people, I mean, I used to use it too, uh, just leave pansy. Um, a flower, you know, womp womp, doesn't really stand up to anything. So if you're looking for something that's like, oh, it's not very sturdy, go for a flower. Stop using genitalia associated with women as a derogatory term. That's shitty. It's just shitty behavior. It's just a shitty thing to do. And I don't think that men who are like, oh, I'm so beefy and I call you a pussy if I don't think you're being masculine enough. I don't think of them as, as, as like good, wow, amazing, masculine people. I think of them as like shameful. Uh, I think of them as annoying and I would not pay them to do masculine things for me. I would, I would pay them to get the fuck out of my face. Like I would, I don't want to be around 
a bunch of muscular, stupid ass men who use the word pussy as if it, as if, like, I'm sorry, I have a vagina and that thing took a fucking beating when I had kids. So pussies take a lot more than uh, penises do. So you can go ahead and go fuck yourself for writing that six times into a book, Jennifer. Like we could have made masculine men who aren't sexist and we just couldn't do it. Samson's right, it's a trap. Um, there's a note about here about how they use the exact same alphabet as Earth. Oh my God, I'm shocked, another plot hole. Um, okay, so then they rescue Idalia. She says, my blood boiled at the sight of a thick stream of blood dripping from her pelvic area. Sick bastards. It was then I knew that she was going to write sexual assault aftermath. So I'm going to now preface this with, if you are a victim of sexual assault, or survivor of sexual assault, or you cannot read, like it cannot deal with that, I'm going to talk about how she depicted um, the aftermath of sexual assault and how bad it is. So I would skip ahead to here um, if you're not comfortable with that because I am going to dissect the language she used and I think it could be triggering. So I would not stay if that's a problem for you. I know that that can be really triggering for some people. So I would just really encourage you to not watch <laughs> until uh, that timestamp. So then Pollux, the guy who raped Idalia, um, walks out of Zenith's and he's like, oh, uh, Cyrus takes uh, Idalia and runs back to Aya, the doctor's house. And so they are at a standoff with Pollux, members of Zenith's inner circle. Zenith, again, being the dictator. And so there's members of the inner circle and Pollux, the extremely rapey one, um, who threatened to rape Idalia in the last book, who threatened to rape Alara multiple times and is going to do so some more. Um, he comes out <laughs> and... Um, the bitter taste of bile stung my taste buds as he dangled his knife in the air. Fresh blood, Idalia's blood, dripped off the blade onto the snow. I don't understand how that's possible. I don't understand how it could be Idalia's blood. How did they get away from him if he was just cutting her up? How did... Uh, it doesn't make any sense. The blood is still dripping off the... That doesn't make any sense. That, and there was really no reason for that. Like, you just wanted to sound edgy. All I'm thinking is like, how time-wise did that work out? There's no way. <laughs> Samson, the old guy who mentors them, Jax, Alara, and Orion are all at a standoff with the uh, some of the inner circle members, and J <laughs> um, they get into a fight, and it, and um, Jax is like beating Pollux almost to death after Pollux has like talked about raping people, and uh, but, yeah, it's all stupid. So. <laughs> Samson yells at, at, at Jackson is like, stand down, that's an order. Now Samson is an ex-collector, but he was not a collector during the time that Jax was. And so it's just weird. It's like a you're not my supervisor moment, but I don't know. Jax blinked once, twice, then stared at the torn skin on his knuckles. He like came to, I guess he was in a trance just beating this dude to death. Um, and then when we see that dude again, his face is all fucked up. <laughs> the way she describes it is so bad. It doesn't make any fucking sense. And then like he, uh, at one point it says like, um, that Pollux runs his, his thumb along a blade and like touches blood and she calls it an oily residue. And I'm like, have you ever touched blood before? That shit's not oily. What the fuck? What kind of blood do you got? Do you just like have fried food running through your arteries at all times? What the fuck are you talking about oily residue? He's like, uh, at least the other girl put up a fight. Like, oh, do we have to do the sexual assault thing all the time? It's so, so stupid. I hate it. And then two of them, Apollo and Pollux, the, the guys in the inner circle, it says the Luna didn't lift a hand. He just licked, what? Fuck. He just clicked his tongue against the roof of his mouth in a timed rhythm syncopated with the Grim Reaper's pocket watch. What? What the fuck are you talking about? What the fuck are you talking about? Your metaphors are so bad. This is so bad. This is what happens when women read Jay Kristoff and think, this is peak literature, I can write this. And then they don't ever know that Jay Kristoff is not peak literature. It's not bad. There's a reason why I tell my husband don't read that shit. I'm like, can I just scratch my boob like <laughs> with abandon? So then Zenith gets, um, out and we finally see him. We are at what 40% through this book and we finally have the actual villain on page for the first time and he sucks. And instead of actually depicting him as scary, 
she decides to do a very J. Kristoff thing, in fact, and use other people's uh, creations to define a person. So she says that he was the perfect villain, the Joker and Hannibal Lecter's love child. I shivered. I'm living in a horror movie. Okay, what do you mean by that specifically? The Joker, why? Does he make great plans? Is he the counter part the mirror to the good guy what do you mean what's what particularly that's scary about the joker Hannibal Lecter is he eating people the answers to all of that are no he, she just picked two villains that she I don't know maybe thinks are cool and scary and was like yeah that's my villain no this is so lazy <laughs> oh here it is his fluid movements <laughs> mirrored a well-seasoned green beret deflecting each attack with ease and precision my mouth gave Gaped at his impressive skills. Oh boy, let's just, let's just eat some more military propaganda. A naive part of me hoped he'd appear less terrifying in person. Oh, this is my favorite. Either short like Napoleon Bonaparte or unattractive with a ridiculous mustache similar to the other ruthless dictators who terrorized Earth. Boy, was I wrong. The man was fierce, gorgeous, a god among men. I don't, I don't even have the energy for a joke about that. Napoleon Bonaparte, are you fucking kidding me, Jennifer? So then, um, <laughs> so then Zenith throws knives. Uh, Alara gets stabbed in the stomach. She passes out, and you think, oh shit, this is bad. It's not. She wakes up at back at what's his name, uh, Eli Aya's house, and she she's fine. And then <laughs> they give her this drug, and, and they're like, no, you weren't supposed to drink the whole bottle. But she's fine. Nothing happens to her. It's like there's just no stakes. Why, why even try? Why even try for stakes? What's the purpose? So um, then everybody leaves the room except Jax and her and Jax fool around. They don't have sex, but they fool around right after she was stabbed in the gut. So you could almost say that while the knife got up in those guts, something else almost did too. So then they fool around. Apparently they got to third base, which I'm 30 years old. I could not tell you what the bases are anymore. I have been with my husband since 2008. <laughs> Sorry. So the next morning, ecstasy, elation, and bliss. Those simple yet powerful words whirled in my mind, each sentiment a reflection of my evening spent with Jax. I exhaled a peaceful breath, allowing my body to sink deeper into the mattress. Heavy with the after effects of the previous night's events, my lazy eyes blinked at the dust particles that danced on the sunbeams in the morning light. She also <laughs> says, I inhaled his familiar scent, the sweet aroma of a summer kiss breeze with a dash of raw and undiluted passion. What does raw and undiluted passion smell like, Jennifer? Can you explain that for the class? The class is me. What the fuck does passion smell like? This is... <laughs> Again, my eyes blurred with lust, which again, I don't know what that means. I don't know what that, does your, are your eyes watering because you're literally so horny? Is that a thing? Oh, then she says something that I feel like is probably racist um, because Juju is a uh, Yoruba um, belief. And she says, um, why don't, Jax is like, why don't you take my knife and I'll hold on to Zenith's knife. And she says, no, I don't want you using it either. It probably has bad Juju all over it. What the hell is Juju? You know, dark or negative energy that stays fi fixed on an object. And I'm like, I don't feel like a white person in particular, but definitely not a person who doesn't even know what Yoruba is. Um, I don't think that that you should you should use juju in your book. Again, we have more uh, military propaganda. She said, I searched Jax's eyes for lingering darkness, smudges on his soul. How can you see a smudge on a person's soul from their eyeballs? I don't understand. He reminded me of a soldier who served time in a prisoner of war camp. He tried adjusting to normal life, but the after effects had stamped a permanent impression on his mind and his heart. He, um, POWs are, are definitely a, an interesting conversation worth having, um, but I don't feel like she understands. <laughs> Idalia is not doing well. She doesn't want to eat. Um, she does not sleep. She has nightmares. She's dealing with a lot of after effects from um, horrendous sexual assault. So here's the thing. She describes a conversation where she has Elara talking to Idalia and she tells Idalia, you know, oh, I know what you're going through. Idalia gets really upset. I'm paraphrasing here. All right, let me try to find the excerpt that really bothered me. If she's willing to accept that Pollux has no control over her, 
then she, you know, will be able to move on. Love can lift up a person out of a negative state and bring them to a level of acceptance, which then leads them to forgiveness. The human spirit always prevails. Idalia is a strong woman. Paulus's actions may have dimmed her light, but he didn't extinguish it. And this is just, again, a grave misunderstanding of the after effects of sexual assault. And I know, because I remember, J.M. Beetlejuice talked extensively about her work with, I believe, sexual assault survivors or human trafficking or both. That does not mean that you understand therapy. <laughs> like, you just don't. <laughs> So, because if you did, you wouldn't say such thing. Um, she says that, uh, Idalia says, I lay in bed and think of different ways to end my life. Uh, the dull knives in the kitchen don't work. I've tried while everyone's asleep. I search the house for other alternatives. Um, she gets like really <laughs> explicit about how she's trying to kill herself. And then Alara says, why is, she needed to hear the truth. Why is tough love the hardest thing to give? You are not qualified to help this woman through her sexual assault trauma. And you definitely don't need to give her tough love. Idalia, it's hard to see the silver lining if you're surrounded by a cloud of negative emotions. The mind loves to play tricks. You're a strong woman and you will get through this. Idalia says, I'm not anymore. I don't think I have the courage to say what happened to her out loud. I need to say it, but if I do, that means I'm choosing to accept what happened. Acceptance doesn't mean you're agreeing with what happened. It means you're acknowledging your willingness to move on. The awareness has this awareness has the power to erase the victim mentality that keeps people trapped in the past, trapped in hell. Don't let Pollux win. You are not the victim of his cruel actions. You are not the result of his weakness. I just I I'm not gonna make a joke here because there's really nothing to say other than that's a fucking disgusting thing to write. And I just am I'm just I'm really it's sad. I don't, I don't like this. Speaking of other things that are kind of disgusting, we in the last book discussed how she had made the only queer people in the series, which yes, that persisted. There are no new characters that were introduced that were queer, no old characters that came out as queer. There are no queer characters except the dead former villains who abused their adopted son who became Zenith, the current leader, dictator. And come to find out from uh, people who used to work for the old dictator. The old dictator was not only a queer bad guy, he also would go so far as to necrophilia. He was doing necrophilia. He was having sex with the bodies of dead men who had been tortured. So that's the queer rep that we get. Um, so not only did she not decide to not do that, she doubled down in this book. So that's upsetting. Alara says weird shit to Jax. Like, he says, you're a huge pain in my ass to Alara, and she says, at least this ass has a conscience. Your conscience resides in your butt cheek. Then they talk about how not only is there a clear stone, which is the stone that if you rub it together, it disappears. There's also a fired stone. Uh, and apparently knives on a runix are mostly made up of clear stone mixed with fired stone. All of this is stupid, and uh, I don't care about it. And fired stone blades are the strong ones, so... There's that. Some dudes, some young guys show up from Zeniths and are like, we want to join you. And uh, then more people show up and they're like, we also kind of want to hear you out and join you. And Alara like takes up the position of being the leader. Then they go to check out uh, the four different villages and they find one uh, with a pile of bodies, uh, including dead women and children. And then the next chapter is such a switch because it goes from this pile of dead bodies to them going to see the only animal that resides on a runix, the, gra the grazers, who don't like women. And Alara's like, ugh, sexism. What are you gonna do? It's like, I, you could not write it. <laughs> okay. Then they find out that um, while they've been away, uh, Zenith's, inner Zenith's, Zenith's, Zenith's inner circle attacked Aya's house where their, you know, people are, you know, hiding out, doing resistance things. And uh, they killed a bunch of people, including Aya himself, which was Orion's dad. So Orion is now the only doctor on Arunix. There's also this kid that follows them around called Blaze, who's like, ah, shucks, you guys are the coolest. And uh, his mom died. It's just like a bunch of death that means nothing to me because I don't care about this story or its characters. Then they're like, all right, well, we need to uh, go and attack. And Zenith sends a note to Alara, says, meet me tomorrow uh, at the village. Uh, and it's all, it's going down and yeah so that's it's gonna be the final battle right <laughs> and up to this point cyrus has been being cryptic and weird about everything 
Um, so you knew from the beginning, because of this cryptic, weird bullshit that he's been doing since the beginning of the book, he's gonna die. So <laughs> the night before, um, Cyrus and Idalia don't hook up because Samson turns out to be Idalia's biological dad, and of course cocklock Cyrus because adults are not allowed to have sex if they are related in any fashion to Samson, who is patriarchal and calls everybody a pussy for no reason. But you know who does hook up is Jax and Alara. They finally have sex, a la Brisan and Farah. <laughs> Very much. In fact, down to the wording, which was like really fucking creepy in how similar it sounded to Theron J. Mass. His tongue, damn that glorious tongue, moved in lazy circles. He flicked it between rotations pushing me further over the edge. This just sounds like Sarah J. Mass copy paste, which I don't like Sarah J. Mass as sex scene, so this is not great for me. My teeth sank into his shoulder, drawing blood. I'm sure the entire campsite heard me shout my enthusiasm, but at that moment, I didn't care. The night before a war, everybody's depressed and you don't care that you're like having loud sex <laughs> when people just died. Oh, Sarah, is that you? Sarah Janet? Hello? Um, at one point, uh, he goes down on Alara and then it says, um, a lazy smile spread across his face as he watched my heavy eyelids blink. The evidence of my pleasure dripping off his chin. I just, this is not sexy. I'm not done with you yet. He wiped off his mouth and pulled me onto his lap. I wish that I was done. I wish that at that point I had been done with this book. So they have gross sex and then the next day they go into battle. What happens? Um, well, first of all, Pollux, who Jack's beat to a bloody pulp, you know, the serial sexual predator, his face is described as like his eyebrow was in the middle of his forehead and his mouth was over here. So he looks like some kind of weird fucking abstract painting of a face instead of an actual face. It makes no fucking sense because she can't just, you know, write. <laughs> and of course, Zenith dressed for the occasion. She's like, he gelled his hair back. I didn't know they had gel on a runix. And He's like dressed really nicely in like a matching outfit. It's like, this is so st I do not care. I do not care. So they get into a battle and what happens? Cyrus dies and Alara is heartbroken. But Alara already had a descent into madness with that mass dealer where a few chapters ago, she almost committed suicide and then had a dream where her mom told her all these nice things, how her mom is somehow alive in dream world, we don't know. And she's like, and tell Cyrus that his sacrifice will not have been made in vain. So like we knew he was going to die and Alara magically gets over her depression. Uh, the mass dealer, you know, goes away. Everything's hunky-dory <laughs> because she can't write stakes to save her life. JM board meeting just cannot make any stakes ever. So they go into battle, Cyrus dies, and Alara very quickly gets over it. <laughs> And she's like, oh no. And then she absorbs, also again goes into dreamland and like absorbs her brother. So now she, like Zenith, is half Solon, half Lunin, has powers. Powers that Zenith does not have despite also being half Solon, half Lunin. Why Alara is different, there's no explanation. Alara ends up um, being able to like get rid of all the weapons. Like she blasts out heat and Somehow he is described as a mirage, even though it's a real thing, it's not fake. And then they, uh, all the weapons are on the ground. And then Zenith <laughs> says, I won't die by your hand. I'll die by my own hand. And um, takes a drug called Minlav, which is mint and lavender scented, apparently, Minlav. And then he dies. So Alara jumps back to Earth because uh, also all along apparently she was a seeker, just like Jax. I don't care because that power is stupid. And she jumps back to Earth. She tells her parents what happened. She introduces them to Jax as her fiance, which by the way, they were engaged at some point in this book. I don't care. <laughs> and then she goes to Cyrus's house, which by the way, the, uh, the Hispanic maid still works there, still doesn't speak English. The only, the only Latinx representation in this book again. She tells Cyrus's parents what happens then. They go back to Arunix. They live their life together. Alara is essentially president and there's a council 
uh, with however many people are still alive on this planet, like 1500s, uh, assumedly at this point. Yeah, everything's hunky dory. It's, you know, US 2.0, essentially. Whatever they <laughs> in JM beef sandwiches mind, it's fine. And yeah, so. And then they have two kids, uh, twins, uh, naturally. And uh, then there's like some little hints that there will be more to this series. And all of them are stupid, and I don't care about them. <laughs> like, uh, this was, without a doubt, one of the most unenjoyable things that I have ever read. I never, ever, ever want to read anything by this author again. Even if I didn't think that she was kind of a shitty person, her writing is just bad. It's just bad. Everything about this was bad. Uh, in the end, she thinks Jay Kristoff, which that's right on point. That is, <laughs> that is hilarious. <laughs> Another author who writes things just for shock value, can't get their readers to actually, you know, engage with what they're reading, and also uh, describes things in ways that make absolutely no fucking sense. Yep, that's that's right on the money. So, what did we learn? J.M. Beer Bubbles cannot write a book. Please stop trying to imitate Jay Kristoff and Sarah J. Mass in books to all writers out there. Listen, I'm trying to write too, and it's really fucking hard. It's really fucking hard. Um, but if this can be a thing, then anybody can write a book. Uh, so I sure as shit can. <laughs> so that's it. That's, that's a wrap on this. Um, I don't know what the next Does This Deserve One Star book will be. I have, um, been asked to read a few of them. Right now I am reading Portrait of a Thief, which is going fantastically. Uh, <laughs> it's nice to read fiction that is just good, so... Yep. Anyway, leave your comments down below. Thank you for watching. Thanks for going on this terrible journey with me. Um, no, I'm not going to read her other, uh, her, her expanded series on this. I won't do it. I'm so sorry, but no. Give me somebody else, anybody else. To, put somebody else in the comments for me to read, but I can't do this, this lady anymore. It's, woof, Jennifer. Oh, you owe me for therapy. Anyway, okay, that's it. Thanks for watching. See you next time. Bye.